All right. So today we're talking um, in honor of Women's History Month. We're doing this forum on Elizabeth Johnson's book, She Who Is. The subtitle is The Mystery of God in Feminist Theological Discourse. Um, and uh, Dr. Johnson is a well-known systematic theologian. Um, she's contributed a lot to feminist theology, but not only, as, as, we'll, as we'll get to by the end of this. So jump right in. I'd like to give a little bit of information about the person that we're talking about before we actually get to the text. Uh, Johnson was born to an Irish Catholic family in 1941, and at an early age, I think sometime in her 20s, she joined uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph, a Roman Catholic religious order, uh, which I believe she's still a member. Um, so she is um, basically a, a nun, although she's not a cloistered nun, but someone who works out in the world. Um, and her vocation is obviously to teach theology. Um, she uh, did her undergraduate and master's work in 1964, finished it in 1964, and she taught, I think, at the high school level for a few years. I think she taught religion, uh, but in the 70s, she went to the Catholic University of America here in Washington, D.C., earning a Ph.D. in theology in 1981, and she was the first woman to uh, receive a Ph.D. in theology from CUA, so it's a pretty, pretty big deal as well. Uh, here's her dissertation. In case you're really curious, analogy, doxology, and their connection with Christology and the thought of Wolfhart Pannenberg. Don't worry, the presentation today does not engage in that kind of word salad um, thing. It's a lot of ologies going on there. Don't worry, we will cut through some of that. Uh, but I always like, whenever we say someone has a PhD, I like to give the title of their dissertation because that's really what makes you a PhD. And sometimes it's actually really interesting to see what um, they wrote. MLK, for example, has a dissertation at Boston University, which I read through most of and which is really worth people's attention. We forget that he was an academic at one point as, as well as a preacher and civil rights leader. Um, James Cone's dissertation, we talked about Cone last month, actually is really interesting and I want to read it for my own kind of research purposes. So I just wanted it here so people were aware. If any of those uh, ologies really catch your attention and you wanna learn more about them, her dissertation might be worth your time. And if you can't find it published, you should be able to contact Catholic University and they can provide a copy to you. I don't think she published that dissertation as a separate book. She taught at Catholic University for about a decade, but then she moved to Fordham. Let me try to get rid of this little, there we go. Uh, she moved to Fordham University, which is in either South Bronx or North Manhattan. Um, and she's been at Fordham now for the last 30 years. She still teaches at Fordham today. And here is Dr. Johnson um, 30 years ago. And unfortunately, the two pictures I have of her that I thought were good pictures of her, they're really like pixelated, so my apologies. But that's just what I found on the internet. So there you have it. But today we're talking specifically about her book, uh, She Who Is. At the end, I'll show she has many other publications. But today we're just talking about one book because even that is plenty to try to get through in the time I'm trying to get through it. So Johnson actually begins this text, although she talks about this idea that it'll be a feminist theological text. She begins the part one by discussing the, the mystery of God, the necessary and utter mysteriousness of God. And she draws on the deep tradition um, although she'll come to ask some questions of the tradition, one of the points I really want to make clear is Johnson has a deep respect for Christian theological and philosophical tradition. Tradition. She has deep respect for Christian scripture, not surprisingly, as a Christian theologian. Although she will ask some questions, uh, she does not throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were. So she begins with a tradition, and she points out that uh, God being utterly mysterious, God being um, beyond the human capacity to truly grasp and understand. This is not a new claim. It is a claim from tradition. If we go to scripture, scripture tells us God is fundamentally unknowable. If we go to early philosophy, not only Christian philosophy, but the philosophy that predates the church, we see this claim time and again, that God is utterly mysterious. So as we begin our theological work, we're trying to know someone who can't be known. And that may sound like a strange thing to do, and maybe it is a strange thing to do, um, but she wants us to be clear that that is what we're doing. And that that sets the contours for how our discussion should operate. We shouldn't claim to have more knowledge about God than we can really have. She's not saying we can't know anything, but she's saying we can't know everything. We can't have an exhaustive concept of who God is. And again, she's not just saying this. This is simply due to who God is. And this is a limitation on human thought that has been recognized for thousands of years. 
Now, this particularly comes into play when we start using our language to try to describe or define God, because we draw our language from the world around us. For the most part, our language has to do with stuff in time and space, right? Most of our words are drawn from that. And not just our nouns, but our verbs describe things that can happen in the world around us. The things that language describes are defined, they're limited, they happen in space and time, they have a beginning and an end. Well, none of those things refer to God. None of those things limit God. God is not limited by space or time. God does not begin or end. God is not defined or limited in general by anything. So the very nature of how human language works, any human language, any possible human language, means that language can't actually describe what theological language is trying to describe. So we have, we have, we have real limits in our ability to talk about God. <clears throat> Excuse me. God is that absolute reality, which is the condition of possibility for the kinds of things that language describes. God stands logically prior to the whole world that language is a part of and that language attempts to describe. And again, this is not a newfangled, postmodern uh, theological idea. This goes deep into the tradition, most famously Augustine. Augustine of Hippo, right? As a side note, we're St. Augustine's Augustine of Canterbury, right? The much less well-known <laughs> Augustine. Augustine of Hippo, the, the big Augustine, has a famous expression in Latin, si comprehendus non est Deus. If you have understood, then what you have understood is not God. God always transcends our understanding. And as I said, uh, Johnson makes it clear. And I'm sorry about uh, the projector, I think, maybe getting old or there's something wrong. My screen is, is fine here, but there's anything on here. I apologize for those in person. Um, a few words are getting lost. Uh, I need to maybe look at the projector. It may just be getting old. Um, but actually, this is a, a case where you on Zoom get a, a better view than those in person. So there you go. A little bit of justice, right? Um, so again, our language about God is always limited. It can never be precise and it can never be exhaustive. Again, doesn't mean we can't talk about God, but we can't describe everything we might want to know about God. And indeed, we can't actually speak about God directly because of the way our language works, because of the way it refers to objects in the world when we're trying to describe something or someone that's not an object in the world, our language can't directly refer to God. It can only refer indirectly, as, as we'll discuss uh, brief, uh, soon. And again, Johnson is clear. This is not her newfangled idea that language is limited in this way. Um, no less a figure than Thomas Aquinas, uh, I think, without question, the most influential Roman Catholic uh, theologian and philosopher, was very clear about this. Aquinas says, there's a little bit of technical language here, that language about God is never univocal, nor is it equivocal. So univocal would mean that we could use a word to describe God, and it means the same thing that it would mean if we use that word to describe a person or something in the world, right? If we say that the chair is strong, we might say God is strong. Aquinas says, but they don't mean the same thing. The word strong here is meant in a different way. It's not univocal. On the other hand, it's neither is it equivocal. Equivocal would mean that you have a word used in ways in which there's no relation whatsoever. He says it's not equivocal either. The word isn't used in the same way that we use it to describe things in the world, but neither is it utterly unrelated. Rather, it's analogical. We use analogy to talk about God. So we say that God is strong and God's strength is sort of maybe similar to the way that a chair or a person or a building could be strong, but obviously not in the same way. God is not a set of load-bearing bricks that holds up weight. So it's sort of similar and sort of different. And what Aquinas ultimately says is there's this three-part three -part process for talking about God. Uh, first, we affirm some similarity between the name or the term and God. So yes, God is strong. Then we say, but we have to negate the illusion that God is strong in the same way that a creature, a thing, might be strong. So we, God is strong, but God is not strong in the same way that a chair is strong or a person is strong. Finally, we have to move beyond the affirmation and the negation, and we say that God seems to express that name or term in a perfect way. 
Sometimes this is called the eminence of that idea. So God is the perfection of strength. A chair, a person, a building is not the perfection of strength. The strength of things in the world has its limits. But God is somehow the perfection of strength. And then we can apply this to any term. God is the perfection of love. God's lovingness isn't identical to human lovingness. It doesn't have the limits, the deficiencies of human lovingness. But it's somewhat similar. It's the perfection of what love could be. So our, our, our analogical language about God always has to have this threefold structure, affirming a similarity, but negating a similarity, and then transcending the limits of our language. And again, another quick example, because I know this, this idea might be a little tricky. Uh, the church has often referred to God as our rock, right? The rock of salvation. Um, God is like a rock in some ways. God is strong. God is firm. God is not easily changed or moved. But of course, God is much more not like a rock. God is living. God is dynamic. God loves. God creates. A rock does none of these things. So God is sort of like a rock, but in many ways not like a rock. And then finally, we say, indeed, even in the ways that God is similar to a rock, God is much more so. God is stronger. God is firmer. God is even less easily changed than any rock. Indeed, God is the perfection of strength, the perfection of firmness, the perfection of unchangeability, etc. So I hope that that's relatively clear, although this is a process that's um, designed to help us notice mystery. So it's not totally clear, and that's part of what it's trying to do. Um, but we can also talk more about this afterwards if people have further uh, questions or thoughts on this. But for now, Johnson notes that there are serious implications if we take the mysteriousness of God seriously. It has real implications um, for how we can talk about God, right? The names that we use for God are always only true analogically. They have limits. And we should never allow any name for God to be sort of become too concrete. We should never fall into the illusion that any term or any name we use for God somehow captures uh, God's truth entirely. This would apply, for example, to the word God itself. The word God itself is just a word. Our concept of God is not God. And if we can remember that, then we can approach uh, theology and worship with the humility that we need, although this also makes theology much harder, admittedly. But of course, this is also true for other names that we use for God. We often use words like Father. We just use the word Father a whole bunch in our worship service. We use the word son to refer to the second person of the Trinity. We use the word Lord, right? These words are fine to use, but we need to remember that they are analogies. God is not literally a father. God, the second person of the Trinity, is not literally a son. God is not literally a Lord, like a land, like a landlord or an aristocrat. There are some ways in which God is similar to human fathers, human sons, and human lords. There are many other ways in which God is entirely dissimilar. And even in the ways that God is similar, God would be the perfection of what fatherhood would mean, the perfection of what sonhood or, or childness would mean, the perfection of what a truly just Lord would be, etc. But these words have limits. They are not literal descriptions of God. They are human analogies that help us to try to understand who God is. But here's the danger, right, that we forget that these are analogies. And indeed, especially masculine terms are used so often to refer to God that it's easy for us to slip into the illusion that somehow God actually is a man, that God actually is male. Even though the Christian tradition and the Jewish tradition and the Islamic tradition, at least in many other traditions, but the Abrahamic traditions are crystal clear that, of course, God isn't a man. And of course, God isn't male. Men and maleness are aspects of the created world. God stands before creation. God is not limited by sex or gender or any other category of being. And, and uh, in fairness to the church, uh, even, even in its, uh, the deep tradition of the church, the church has always been very clear in teaching this. God is not a man. God is not male. Right. But if all of our language in church and all of our language in theology text refers to God primarily with these masculine terms, and indeed, if we even use pronouns like he and him and his, as we often do, we just did even in church, um, then there's the danger that even though we know we're not supposed to, that we fall into this idea of thinking of God as somehow inherently masculine. And this is a danger that Johnson wants to draw our attention to and ultimately wants to provide uh, other possible ways of balancing this issue.
Uh, and this brings her to her central point, right? God is not actually man or male. Um, the church has always agreed with this. So what if we also used feminine terms to refer to God? If we can use male terms, and we know that male terms are analogical, we know that God isn't actually male, et cetera, et cetera, why can't we use feminine terms to refer to God? According to this method of naming God through analogy, feminine terms would be exactly as sufficient, exactly as appropriate, and exactly as limited and deficient as male or masculine terms. And her whole process through parts one and into part two of the book is really just to, to clear the ground and make it obvious that there is no theological or philosophical reason to not use feminine terms to refer to God, right? She's done all this work, and I'm I'm summarizing a lot, right? She spent a lot of time um, really making this point. And the good news, again, remember, Johnson is not here to throw out anything, and she's not here to, to overturn the tradition. She wants to critique. She wants to develop. But Johnson points out, actually, scripture and Christian theology has indeed used feminine terms to refer to God. This, again, isn't a new idea. It's just been a very small sort of minority usage with 99% of language being male dominated. But there have been these threads of, of feminine um, terms for God, of analogies to the lives of women, et cetera. So really quickly, we're just gonna go through, these are just some examples, not all examples. For example, the uh, word for spirit in Hebrew, ruach, um, there's a related word, shekinah. These are, oath, these are both grammatically feminine terms. Of course, um, feminine grammar is not the same thing as embodied gender, and we have to have questions about what that is too. Um, but nevertheless, often spirit and shekinah are, have been understood in ways that could also be uh, seen as feminine more deeply than just in the grammatical sense. Likewise, in Greek, um, the word wisdom, Sophia, is grammatically feminine and has often been presented, um, especially in the deuterocanonical text uh, of scripture, as a woman, as a woman's voice. Again, as an analogy, not literally that wisdom is somehow feminine any more than God is actually masculine. Um, here's a long quote, okay, from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 10. And you've heard this language. We've used this as a canticle in worship last year. Um, wisdom freed from a nation of oppressors, a holy people, and a blameless race. She entered the soul of a servant of the Lord, withstood dread rulers with wonders and signs. To the saints, she gave the reward of their labors and led them by a marvelous way. She was their shelter by day and a blaze of stars by night. She brought them across the Red Sea. She led them through mighty waters. But their enemies she swallowed in the waves and spewed them out from the depths of the abyss. Notice here that wisdom is doing the things that God does in the Exodus, right? God is the one who leads the people. God is the one who brought them across the sea, who shelters them. So here we have um, even uh, female um, pronouns being used here. And that's that's significant. And this is in scripture. This is in scripture. This is a part of scripture that we call the apocryphal or deuterocanonical texts. Script, scriptures written by Jewish people, but written in Greek. But the Episcopal Church recognizes these as a valid part of scripture. Not all churches do, and not really for this reason, it's worth pointing out. Um, but the Roman Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, the Lutheran Church do recognize the legitimacy of these texts, as well as the Orthodox churches. But that's not it. There are plenty of other references. Deuteronomy 34, 18. Uh, you were unmindful of the rock that begot you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. Notice two very different analogies for God. God is a rock, and God is also a mother who gives you birth. Again, not only giving us an example of a, of a feminine a reference to God, but a reminder of that God's, the language about God is analogical. God can be a rock and a mother, because these words aren't meant literally. Likewise, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 14. For a long time, I have kept silent. This is God speaking. Uh, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. Uh, again, God speaking about God's self and using a, this comparison, this analogy of a human woman here. And again, a mother. Or consider uh, Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39. Jesus says this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. 
Now, in this case, it's not referring to a human woman, but it's absolutely a, a female um, comparison. And again, a reminder, God can be understood as a rock, as a man, as a woman, or indeed as a chicken. Anything in the universe can be used as an analogy for God if we do it thoughtfully. Um, so again, a reminder, not only of the appropriateness of female, feminine terms, um, but also of, of nature um, being a, a stock of, of terms we can use to refer analogically uh, to God. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, plenty of other references. Moving to the tradition, um, Christian theologians who have used um, female imagery to refer to God, and some of Canterbury, um, who is a very influential uh, 11th uh, century theologian, um, said this, wrote a prayer. And in this prayer, he said this, and you, Jesus, are you not also a mother? Are you not the mother who, like a hen, gathers her chickens under her wings? He's referring here to the, path, the passage from Matthew. Truly, Lord, you are a mother, for both they who are in labor and they who are brought forth are accepted by you. So here's Jesus presented as, as a mother. And a similar maneuver from Julian of Norwich, herself a woman, um, who wrote in the uh, 1300s and the 1400s. And uh, here's a, something from a uh, canticle that she wrote. And again, we've used this also at St. Augustine's. God chose to be our mother in all things, and so made the foundation of his work most humbly and most pure in the virgin's womb. God, the perfect wisdom of all, arrayed himself in this humble place. Christ came in our poor flesh to share a mother's care. Our mothers bear us for pain and for death. Our true mother, Jesus, bears us for joy and endless life. Notice again, not only the reference to God as a mother or the analogy uh, of God as a mother, but Julian continues to use masculine pronouns to refer to God and refers to God as a mother. So there's also a play with the understanding of gender uh, going on here. I know that recently this idea that we might question um, easy dichotomies of gender seems like some new and dangerous idea. It is not. Well, it might be a dangerous idea to some people, but it's not a new idea, okay? Uh, the church has been doing this for a long time, um, but so easily we forget these things. And it doesn't end there. Here's uh, John Paul I. That's right, John Paul I, who was only pope for 33 days. Um, John Paul II came right after him. Um, there was a meeting in 1978 at Camp David where leaders from the U.S., Israel, Egypt, and I think some of the Palestinian leadership were gathering for a peace talk. And uh, John Paul was asked to contribute to this, as well as Jewish and Islamic thinkers. And this is part of the statement he released. Also, we who are here have the same sentiments, the same sentiments as the Islamic and Jewish leaders who were there talking about peace and, and God's call for peace. We are the objects of undying love on the part of God. We know. He is always his eyes open on us, even when it seems to be dark. He is our father, even more. He is our mother. He does not want to hurt us. He wants only to do good to us, to all of us. If children are ill, they have additional claim to be loved by their mother. And we too, if by chance we are sick with badness on the wrong track, have yet another claim to be loved by the Lord. Again, notice John Paul saying that if God is a father, God is even more a mother. That's a pretty strong uh, endorsement. But again, notice, continues to use masculine pronouns to refer to God, even as talking about God as a mother. Um, so again, complex approach to, to gender here, but it opens up possibilities for further thought and dialogue, right? So having considered all of this, having considered that language about God is always limited, having considered that we can only speak about God through analogy, having considered that there's every theological and philosophical reason to use uh, female, feminine, um, woman-related terms to refer to God as analogies for God, having considered that indeed scripture and the tradition have already been doing so from the get-go, Johnson says, look, this has application for us. This can change things for us now in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and it's important to do so because she points out that, again, as I've already suggested, when we assume some kind of maleness or masculineness to God, even if we know that it's not literally true, but if we're constantly using only and primarily um, male or masculine terms to refer to God, then this can become itself a justification for denying full equality to women in the church. Um, and again, this isn't a speculation. This actually has happened. For example, as we discuss uh, the ordination of women, of course, in the Episcopal Church, 
We've been ordaining women to the priesthood since uh, 1977. The Roman Catholic Church still does not. Um, and part of their argument against the ordination of women is that the priest has to stand in persona Christi. That is, the priest at the altar, according to this doctrine, represents Christ, is sort of in the person of Christ. Um, and then they say, well, Jesus was a man, therefore the priest has to be a man. Uh, now, this is not a very good argument. And I'm actually going to, uh, Johnson focuses on the second part. I just want to begin by saying this argument is bad all the way through. The first thing is, I reject, as a priest, as a Christian priest, I reject the idea that the priest stands in persona Christi, right? And this is not the model of priesthood we see in the Hebrew scriptures whatsoever. The priest does not stand in for God. The priest stands in for the people. The priest is just a human being that's representing other human beings. We can't fit every human being at the altar. So we pick one human to go up, but the words that I speak, I'm speaking for all of us. I'm speaking for all of us as humans to God. I'm not representing God, nor am I representing Christ. When I quote the words of institution, um, this is my body, take and eat. I'm quoting Jesus. I'm not Jesus saying those things. I'm quoting what he said to us, right? So to first off, I think the beginning of this argument is just theologically and sacramentally incorrect, right? Johnson, though, focuses on the second aspect uh, of this argument, which is obviously uh, an error. Um, we don't apply this reasoning to any other aspect of Jesus, right? So if we're saying, hey, Jesus was a man, therefore priests have to mean men. Well, what about the other traits of Jesus? Jesus was Jewish. Do Christian priests have to be Jewish? That would be interesting, um, to say the least. Um, Jesus, uh, right, uh, didn't speak English. Do priests have to be non-English speaking people? English didn't even really exist as a language when Jesus was alive. Um, Jesus was a carpenter, or at least the son of a carpenter. Do I need to be a carpenter to be a priest? Um, Jesus was almost certainly a person of color. That terminology didn't exist when he was alive, but I think in our terminology, uh, he was a person of color. Can only people of color be priests? I doubt the Roman Catholic Church would be interested in advancing uh, that argument, um, and, and nor should they be. But it's the exact same reasoning that would lead us to put these limits on the priesthood that they're advancing with this idea that because Jesus was a man, that somehow priests have to be men. Even if you accept that the priest stands in persona Christi, and I don't think that you should, but even if you did, this is nonsense, right? Unless you're willing to say that the person has to be identical to Jesus in all these other aspects. And eventually that would mean no one could be a priest because you would just need Jesus there, right? If you really wanted to get strict about this. But again, part of Johnson's argument, right, is that the constant references to God as male creates a context in which this kind of argument gets more readily accepted than it really should be on purely logical grounds because we're imbued with this constant masculine reference to God. So if we advance the argument that Johnson has advanced so far, it has implications for the church, right, for how we actually organize our community. So having shown that that often unanalyzed masculine understanding of God has these negative impacts, that it can provide support for the oppression and limitation of women, Johnson suggests the opposite might be true. If we were to start using feminine terms for God, like in addition, she's not saying that we would exclusively use feminine terms, but if we added some feminine terms to the stock of, of analogies that we use to refer to God, if we on occasion used uh, feminine pronouns to refer to God. Um, this is, again, theologically, philosophically, logically, perfectly acceptable. She's done a lot of work to show that. And it might also have this really positive impact. Hopefully we see it as a positive impact. That would mean the church will become a place where there's more automatic support for this idea of women's equality, because we've simply used language to remind ourselves that women are just as much created in the image of God as are men. I didn't refer to that quote, but it's worth pointing out that Genesis chapter one says that God created humankind, male and female in God's image. It's explicit at naming both men and women. And again, even if we want to raise questions about gender and sex and people who don't fit neatly into those categories, uh, the point is it does not just say that men are somehow in God's image and women are an afterthought. No, 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 no. Men and women are both created in God's image. Full stop. So by changing the way we refer to God, in ways that are completely in line with tradition, scripture, philosophy, theology, right? There's no violence being done to the tradition here in truth. But if we introduce these feminine terms, 
we might create communities where we're more naturally inclined to support the idea of women's equality, women's equality in the church and women's equality beyond, right? I'm going to pause here. We're, we're close to being done. Don't worry. I <laughs> uh, know I've been moving rapidly through some dense material at times. I do want to note two really important things. Again, Johnson um, goes to great lengths to show that there are excellent theological, philosophical, logical, and scriptural reasons for accepting feminine and female terms for God. There's no, there's no kind of funny business here about trying to slip in this new idea in ways that somehow violate Christian principles. Not at all. And she that's why she spends, you know, a vast number of pages going through this. And there are even more quotes than I than I put up. Of course, she has lots of quotes, lots of references. Scripture, the tradition is clear on this, that um, feminine, female, women adjacent, etc. terms um, are perfectly acceptable as analogies for God. It just as acceptable as a uh, male, masculine, man adjacent terms uh, for God. Right. She's not saying that we should use, uh, say, feminine or female-related terms for God just to advance her political or social goals. She points out that it just so happens that it does do that, but that's not the only reason. This isn't just an effort to somehow push through her political agenda. Rather, she begins by saying theology itself uh, shows us that we ought to be open to using these terms. The second thing that I want to make clear is she is not arguing that we stop using masculine terms for God. She's very clear about this, but I can imagine some people who might be threatened by her, what she's doing might rush to that conclusion. But she's very clear. She has no issues with saying God the Father, God the Son, saying he or him or his for God. She's suggesting that we just also start using feminine terms. Also, maybe on occasion and more and more occasions using um, feminine pronouns that we add to the stock of analogies and intentionally use feminine, female, woman-related terms to refer to God as, as, as analogies for God. But she's not trying to get rid of anything we're doing. She wants to add to, add to, right? She does not advocate for the cessation of masculine terms for God. I just want to be really clear about that because my guess is that plenty of people accuse her of that. That will be an easy way to try to um, undercut her argument here. She does not do this. And she herself is clear in the text. But, you know, plenty of people criticize books they haven't read. So I just wanted to make sure um, that we, we put that up there. All right, my friends, we're coming to the end. Uh, you've made it. So in concluding She Who Is, again, Johnson has tried to show a few different things. First, language about God is always limited and imperfect. We have to remember that we cannot grasp the full and infinite mystery of God. We cannot confuse a name for God, for who God is. That includes the word God itself. Right? Every term we have for God is an analogy. We must remember that. Second, feminine, female, and women adjacent, etc. terms, names for God are theologically, philosophically, scripturally, liturgically, etc. appropriate. There is no reason to reject these terms. Um, the argument in favor of them is identical to the argument in favor of, of masculine or male adjacent terms. And again, they not only might enrich our understanding of who God is, they also open up pathways for the church's work in the world. If we believe as Christians that we should be working for the equality of women, and I hope that we do, then this change, for example, introduced in our liturgy, introduced in Bible study, et cetera, might actually open up ground for us to do that work better. Because if we assume um, that these masculine terms for God are somehow more appropriate, there's some part of our minds, even if it's subconscious, that are actually thinking there's something about men that's actually that's better, right? It's hard to avoid that conclusion if we were to ex if we uh, continue exclusively using only male terms for God. Um, and again, although she's again very clear that there are great uh, logical grounds for doing this, she does think that this impact, this impact that the church would be better equipped to struggle for women's equality, is a reason to is an additional reason to accept the use of these terms because this is a good thing. If God is a liberating and loving God, then that includes God is a liberating and loving God for women, not only for men. And that means the church ought to be working for women's equality. Full stop. Finally, and here I'm summarizing all of part three, which is three chapters. Uh, so I'm sorry, but this is already pretty long. So I really, I really had to compress this last part. And this last part is sort of more about, I think, her laying the groundwork for future work, building on her work. Um, but she uses this last section of the text to argue that feminine references to God can also help theologians do some work that Christian theology has long uh, struggled with, 
um, trying to understand how God is relational, right? Both as a Trinity, that God somehow is this unity of relation. We often fall into very static images of God, rock, um, or we think of God as maybe some kind of ball of light. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity has always said that there's this dynamic and relational aspect of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and somehow they're they're all in this relation. It's not static, it's dynamic, but our language often doesn't convey that. And her argument is that um, feminine and, and woman-related terms often tend to involve more sense of relation. I mean, she has a, a further argument that, and she cites other feminist thinkers on this subject. And so she thinks, actually, you know, these terms might enrich our understanding of the Trinity. Likewise, they might make it easier for us to sort of theorize and understand how God, although transcendent, does relate to our world, how God can be both transcendent and yet active in our lives as well. Um, and finally, also, um, Christian, Christian theology has long struggled with how to understand God's compassion, right? If God is transcendent and God is unchanging and unmoved and absolute, compassion tends to involve change, pain, suffering. How, how do we think about God as somehow absolute and unchanging, but also compassionate towards us, suffering with us in solidarity with us? That's a tricky theological issue, but Johnson suggests that, you know, feminine terms might open up new ways of thinking about that, new pathways for developing new and perhaps uh, more helpful analogies uh, for that. So again, I've, I've given short shrift to the last fifth of the book. If that one uh, number three bullet point is the entire part, but um, in the interest of presenting this in a relatively concise format, um, I made that decision. But that leads me to our last slide, which is, uh, well, no, our second to last slide. Here's Dr. Johnson, a more recent photo of Dr. Johnson from Fordham. And then our truly last slide. Um, if you've heard any of this and you're thinking, wow, this sounds really interesting, please note, uh, this is a very, 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 very concise summary of a 275-page book. If you're really curious, I'd recommend go read Dr. Johnson yourself. You can read her works. Uh, the book we discussed today is She Who Is, The Mystery of God in Feminist Theological Discourse, published in 1992. She has many other texts. I'm not going to say all the names. So I'll put them on the screen here um, for you all to look at. And uh, I'm happy to say, too, that I find Johnson to be a very clear writer. I, I mentioned this when talking about Dr. James Cohn last month, who I thought was also an extremely clear writer. Um, Johnson tends to go a little bit more into jargon than I think Cohn did. Cohn was really good about trying to keep the text, I think, really approachable to a non-specialist. There are some parts of Johnson where I think, it gets a little denser, but even there, there's a clarity to her writing that um, makes it easier for me to recommend to a general audience. You could pick up one of these books and really pick up what she's laying down. That's not true of all theologians and philosophers. Um, sometimes their writing, their ideas are great, but their writing is not always so good. But I can say, I think uh, Johnson's writing is very clear and approachable. So if you are curious about what she's been talking about and you want to read more, I recommend uh, doing precisely that. And that, my friends, um, is uh, my presentation.